let's get started. Um, hello and uh, welcome everybody um, to this panel discussion. Uh, the topic of this discussion today is architecting resilience, navigating complex ecosystems in times of continual business change, business transformation. And uh, I know that sounds like a mouthful, but we'll try and break that down. Uh, but before we do that, let's uh, do some introductions. Uh, and before that, uh, by the way, I think you should be able to put some questions in the chat, in the session chat. So uh, I will keep an eye on the chat and uh, we'll try and address them. Don't wait until the end necessarily to you know, ask your question because if it's, related, if it's relevant to uh, the discussion that's happening at any point of time, then you can try and incorporate that into the answer. Uh, if you want to address that question to a particular person on the panel, I think that should be fine as well. Um, all right, let's uh, sort of get to the topic um, with the pace of change, you know, greatly increasing and business environments getting more and more complex. Uh, a big challenge is uh, keeping our businesses resilient. And a part of that is also ensuring our architecture, you know, the backbone that holds up the business is resilient. Uh, and uh, also, you know, while tech is important, what's also important and probably more important is uh, to businesses as people. Uh, so there's a human aspect to this. There's an organizational aspect to this. And it'd be good to sort of address that as well. Uh, so let me uh, probably start with Luca. Uh, and after Luca, it'd be good to hear from the other panelists as well. Uh, Luca, how would you interpret uh, resilience? Uh, what does it really mean to for an architect to address resilience? Hey, Vijay. And, uh, hey, guys. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, happy to start. Sorry I, I, sorry, I forgot to sort of let you give you guys a chance to uh, introduce yourselves. Maybe, maybe we'll do a round of introduction and then we can start with this. Absolutely. Uh, Yogini, please start. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So um, hello, everyone. A very good afternoon. Uh, my name is Yogini and I'm joining here from uh, Ericsson Global Headquarters today. I work there um, in the CIO office as enterprise architect, and I have been in the IT industry for some time now, and uh, happy to be part of this panel. So thank you. Uh, Mohil, if you want to go ahead. Yep. Hi, um, I'm Mohil Anand. I am the chief product architect for the firm's AIML platforms in JP Morgan Chase. Um, I've been with the firm three years now. Prior to that, I was a cloud consultant doing a lot of resiliency and SRE stuff as part of the consultancy practices there. So yeah, very much from a tech background. Yeah. And uh, I'm uh, Luca Derisi. I'm a CEO for Mega International. Uh, like many of you know, uh, we do a software for enterprise architecture. We've been around for a long time, over 30 years, but we've been reinventing ourselves uh, multiple times. And today we have a uh, the latest product, the latest version that was released uh, late last year, and I'd be happy to show it to anyone who wants to uh, to learn more about it. Nice. Uh, just a couple of sentences about myself as, as well. Uh, my name is Vijay Nartani. I'm a solutions engineer at Confluent, and uh, at Confluent, I you know get an opportunity to talk to uh, solutions architect, um, I, uh, about, you know, almost on a daily basis about real-time decision making, real-time data. Uh, and data streaming, yeah. Um, so yeah, let's uh, sort of get into it, uh, Luca. Um, what, how would you interpret resilience, and what does it mean for an enterprise architect to address resilience? Yeah, happy to start. Thank you, Vijay. And um, I, I would define resilience as uh, the capacity for a company to uh, resist to external shocks. You know, if we just take the bare definition. Um, external shocks. And I, I could see that at two levels, maybe at a business level and at an IT level. At the business level, the external shocks, in my opinion, would be really new competition, new entrants with disruptive technologies that change your business model. And then we can say a lot about the role of architects when it comes to uh, changing and uh, uh, reinventing the business model and see uh, everything that comes uh, under it. But then there's also the IT perspective of uh, of resilience and then it's your capacity to resist to uh, incidents to uh, cyber attacks uh, but i would um, make a difference here maybe between the the concept of security and the concept of resilience security is the ability to uh, to uh, to address uh, or prevent those uh, 
the cyber attacks and issues. Resilience to, to me means more the impact that those issues have on the business. So it's the capacity of a, a business to be resilient, to resist those shocks by understanding the impact that IT has on the business. And, and that's where architects are, uh, are super important because enterprise architects, because there's a lot of different uh, architects profiles, but enterprise architects are uniquely positioned because they connect the dots. They can connect your, uh, your technology where there is a vulnerability to your application, to your processes or capabilities. That's what architects do. So it's really key to, to um, resiliency. And before I, I, I finish, maybe I can give you an example of architects for sustainability in, in that definition. And that's a shipping company, a customer of ours. A few years ago, they had a massive cyber attack. All the IT was down. But in three weeks, because they had mapped all the environment in the tool, they were able to uh, reset the whole IT quite quickly, despite the massive uh, breakdown. So that, to me, is an example of resiliency and the role of architects, the, the role architects can play when the attack is on a, at an IT level. And then maybe later during the conversation, we could even speak about uh, the DORA regulation, uh, Digital um, Operational Resiliency Act. It's a bit more specific to, to you, Muhil, right? To uh, the financial sector in Europe and every any company that uh, that uh, supplies the, the financial sector. But that's exactly what they ask for. Risk management based on your knowledge of IT and the business. You need to, 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 know, to, to map your capabilities, processes, and, uh, and IT to manage the risks and, uh, and resiliency plan, your whole BCP. Um, to comply. So, um, yeah, it's a very uh, current topic that regulation goes uh, goes into effect in 2025. And I do think that architects have a big role to play. And that's for me, Vijay. Uh, thanks, Luca. Uh, Muhul, do you want to take a jab at that? Yes. Um, that was a great, great kind of a definition of resiliency, Luca. Um, I look at resiliency as the ability of a system or an enterprise to actually anticipate and prepare to events, right? Um, you you talked about like the, the you know the the, the surprise factors like uh, resisting those things from a business perspective, um, from from a technologist's point of view, right? Um, which supports all the business com uh, functions and capabilities. It's about hardening those systems to rapid like to to be able to respond to rapidly changing events. The events can be anything, security events, you know, downtimes or like you know, a, a hard disk fails, right? Like even to that level. And and when you're talking about it in cloud, the paradigms change because your data centers, you're actually touching and feeling the hardware, you know, uh, whereas in, in the cloud, everything's API based. So how do you secure a software, right? Because it's it's effectively at that point as a service, platform as a service, even though it is, it is interfaced through APIs. So the fun becomes about, how do you automate this? Because cloud is about automation. Yeah, it is not like a lot of people talk about cloud is cost ops. Cloud is about automation and resiliency, right? And the ability to adapt to events in a very fast manner. So sometimes when you talk about business resiliency um, and, and the choice of technology to support business resiliency, there are like these new paradigms that comes into play. And well, I say new, cloud's not new, like it's been there for over a decade now. Um, it's it's these things that helps help helps sustain the business in 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 that way. Resiliency is a form of, like you know sustainable. Resiliency is directly mapped to sustainability. You have to be resilient to be sustainable because you, sustainable is not just environment, right? It is about sustaining the business as well. Um, that's what I kind of think, uh, and yeah, uh, it it includes all the whole domains like business, technology, data, information, everything. Do you agree? Do you want to try that? Yeah, uh, great thoughts from Luca and Mohil. Um, when I think about um, uh, resiliency, what comes to my mind is, uh, to me, uh, resilience is about adaptability and flexibility. Because um, just like Mohil said, that sustainability is not just about environment. It's about keeping your business sustainable in the middle of um, the business disruptions that happen today. And uh, we are in times where um, the markets are very, very dynamic. There are uh, 
such rapid changes that not many businesses manage to cope up with the changes that are happening in the market. So um, as enterprise architects, I think how we can enable um, uh, the business resilience is uh, by uh, architecture scenario planning to be uh, flexible enough uh, to be ready for changes for all of these uh, that these disruptions could bring in. And also uh, looking at um, different aspects of enterprise architecture, uh, as Mohil mentioned, you have uh, business process information and then comes technology. So very often we make this mistake of thinking that you know everything revolves around technology. But um, as we know, we have a very famous example of Kodak, which went out of business. And when a case study was performed, it was not because it was not technology ready. It was because they were inflexible to change their business model. Their revenue was based on basically selling the, the, the camera films. And it was not coming from selling the cameras. And they were they had such a rigid affinity with their business model that they were not flexible enough to change that, which essentially, eventually it threw them out of the business. So it starts from your business aspects, getting down to the process aspects. Your process have to be um, agile enough, adaptable enough, flexible enough to be able to enable those digital transformations that keep you ready or that make you ready for these changes. So it, it works at all of these levels. And as enterprise architects, I think this is a great opportunity for us to be part of those transformation and to influence the business decision making to make sure that we are ready for these changes. So that is what adaptability would mean. And of course, governance and um, flexibility along with um, um, adhering to the regulatory um, uh, uh, requirements like uh, Luca mentioned about DORA. Those are a few must have things to make sure that we are resilient. Um, th this is a really good, interesting example that you uh, bring up, Yogini, of uh, Kodak, which is they were so reliant on their existing business model and, you know, the revenue stream of the films that they, you know, it was difficult for them to um, adapt uh, sort of a addiction uh, in a way. Right, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I mean that just reminds me of the uh, the Apple. Uh, I, I think Jobs must have mentioned it at some point. I'm sure, but I think the the idea that they need to be able to cannibalize their own business at some point. Right, um, and you mentioned governance, so that's an interesting um, uh, angle there as well. Uh, can you sort of elaborate on how governance uh, plays into resilience uh, from a sort of architecture? enterprise yeah so if you look at governance there are different aspects that come into play uh, for governance and a very important aspect for that today um, is the data governance side the information and data governance and it becomes all the more complicated for a large-scale organization such as Ericsson where you have uh, uh, 84 multiple locations, uh, 100,000 people working together, trying to work towards a common goal. There are a lot of regulatory requirements and um, governance and um, in terms of security, because it's uh, th there are limitations in terms of sharing data across geographical locations. Mm -hmm. So you need to have very robust governance around how you manage your data, the security aspect that Luca mentioned, how you manage security uh, so, so that there are no breaches, and how do you make sure that you are resilient enough to be ready in all of these locations for your organization to make sure that you are um, safe from cyber, cyber attacks and you, know, you are not falling prey to data breach uh, um, complying with these GDPR um, uh, uh, um, regulations and then so uh, but when it comes to the enterprise architecture aspects in terms of how we can contribute towards governance 
I would say that it starts um, from uh, acknowledging uh, the importance of governance as a very important capability when you are uh, designing your business models. And then when you are working on your process models, you make sure that you consider all the governance aspects across all the, uh, all the um, functional areas, which might include supply, sales, um, marketing, how do they all play together? How, how do you kind of strike the right balance between the processes across each of these because they are ultimately connected with each other, right? So how do you have a common governance guidelines for all of these departments so that they are not siloed in their own way and they're not going in their own directions? And then um, when it comes to information architecture uh, and data architecture, then you get to the physical aspects of data, right? How do you manage data? How do you deploy? Which clouds? Where do you have it on on-prem? Are you going for a hybrid? Or how do you want to deploy this architecture, right? And that is where our blueprint comes into picture. So it is very important to be mindful of taking a step back and having this bigger picture when you design these uh, reference architectures or target architectures for your organization so that uh, uh, different units across the organization can um, adhere and adopt that reference architecture to make sure that you are all aligned towards a common goal. So I think that is how we can uh, contribute towards uh, governance as enterprise architects. That's the, um, thanks, Yogini. Uh, I, I wanted a lot to... of, uh, of very uh, interesting things. You know, Vijay, you could even react on a couple. Yeah. Um... Yeah, this is absolutely interesting. I, I I see a sort of comment in the in the chat as well, uh, that talking about HIPAA compliance as a as a data governance uh, needed for you know business resilience. Uh, so I, I wanted to sort of get to um, resilience when we we talked we talked about interpreting resilience, but you know there's also like different levels of resilience. Now, how resilient do you want to be? Uh, I'm sure there's a cost associated with, you know, uh, getting more and more resilient. Um, uh, so, Mohil, do you want to sort of uh, yeah. address that? How would you sort of take, you know, address that balance between the costs and uh, being resilient? And that's a very sensitive topic, right? <laughs> it's it's the life of an architect, you know. Trade offs, <laughs> trade offs is the bread and butter. You have to, like, like with anything that we're doing, we would have to look at the prioritization of the value of business that we are, you know, the, that we're delivering and where you need to do trade-offs. Vendor products versus build your own, you know, single cloud versus multi-cloud, for example. You, uh, another question about the HIPAA is there and, and there was a question about reversibility, about in, in resilience, right? There's various levels and, and how does your SLAs map to these things in, in the technology terms versus let's assume you're going to have a single cloud provider. What if the cloud provider goes out of business? But while that the risk of that is quite low with the hyperscalers, like, you know, Google's not going out of business tomorrow, right? Like it's, it's you, you will know. Um, versus if a service goes out, like, uh, and, and I'm going to quote Google, Google always deprecates services versus Amazon, like, once it's live, it's live. It's it's there forever. It's very rare that they actually de deprecate a single service in Amazon. Like it's still resilience, right? Because of the architecture that you're doing, there is a technology choice that you do, right? A, a choice that has to be made in terms of the lo location of those, um, you know, the data aspects of things, the 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 compute of 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 that, versus the actual physical location of that business, for example, if it's in Luxembourg, well, Luxembourg has, has its has its own own kind of requirements versus Europe. You know, GDPR comes into play. There is an analysis that has to be done based on the value that you're unlocking, and then a trade off needs to be made, right? So that's kind of my thought in in that. Like, and and the cost aspect of it comes into play usually because the value and cost, they are directly kind of linked. Um, and you think about multiple strategies that people are used in the technology world, like your disaster recovery strategies, backup and restore versus active-active. Backup and, re back and restore is your cheapest, right? Your 
you're taking a backup, shipping it off to an archive, and then when something breaks, you bring it back in, you run tests. Active Active is like they are running warm on both locations, like fully scaled. And this is done when you have to have multi, you know, very kind of low latency changes. It is business critical that it cannot even go down for like a millisecond or whatever. Um, the number of nines matter. But those things are driven by what the business wants. If the business says yes for that 911's resiliency, then you have to pay for it, right? <laughs> Nothing's, nothing in the world is free. If it says, well, and this is where the conversations, the architecture, there is a responsibility on, uh, on the architecture to go and have that conversation and say, hey, do you actually need this? Because your other priorities say something else. You're you're cutting budgets here, but you still are requiring 911 9 uh, uh, you know, um, re resiliency here. Do you, these things don't match. And I think Lucas' point about connecting the dots, this is one of those connecting the, connecting the dots. You're an analyzing things, you're prioritizing what is most important to the business and then solving that problem. Right? If cost is the most important thing, of course it is. Do, do backup and restore. So um, I'm simplifying questions, but yeah, that's what, what, uh, what I kind of think. I'm, I'm sure Luca has something in, to, to add to this, Luca. Uh, what do you think? Both on the sort of governance side, but as well on the, uh, uh, the trade-off between cost and resilience. How would you, um, who, whose job is it to sort of address that? How would, and how would you go about addressing it in an organization? Sure, sure. And thanks, thanks Vijay. I do have more to say on the first topic of, um, of governance which I understand better than, uh, than the trade-offs. But I, yeah, I wanted to react because I fully agree with what Yogini said. A couple of points uh, really uh, to, to took my attention. One of it is when you mentioned knowing, uh, know, knowing what you have. And, and I think their enterprise architects have a very, uh, very, very crucial role because it's not only knowing what you have. You said planning. Indeed, it's knowing what you should have. So architects are here to understand the as is, but also plan for what you should have. So when you have your application portfolio, your technology portfolio, uh, understanding your, your, your business is what there is today, which a lot can be automated. I saw the presentation with the Cubilon earlier, which was really interesting. We do very similar things. So that's the whole automation part. But then architects, they know what you should have. So those are the approved applications. Those are the approved technologies. And that's the governance also. Because now you can go compare what is there installed on the servers and what you are allowed to have. So the risk there is that architects appear like the, the police of the uh, of IT, and you know you need to compensate that policing role with the strategic role, and that comes back to uh, also Yogini what you said and uh, you hear you reacted about connecting the dots, including data governance. And that was the second point that really uh, struck my attention because yes, indeed. It's architecture, especially planning for resiliency. It's not just your risks, incidents, or technologies. It's about how all those interact, because in the end, resiliency means staying in business. So it means understanding the impacts. So, we, and, and that's where everything comes together, whether it's resiliency because there's a new technology that is disruptive on the market or because there's a cyber attack. In the end, the role of the enterprise architect is really about the resiliency. So understanding how everything fits together, connecting the dots to manage the impacts and recover quickly. And data is a big part of it because data is the, the oil, you know, it flows in between your applications, your processes. So a complete architecture practice involves application portfolio, your data, architecture, governance, your risks, because talking about resiliency is talking about the risks and your business, your processes. So that's the view that, of course, we defend uh, at Mega, but it really applies to resiliency. Thanks, DJ. Um, interesting uh, sort of point of view there. Um, I'm sort of uh, really in, uh, interested, sort of intrigued on that um, trade off there. But uh, let's sort of move on to a, a couple of other things. Um, so. You know, uh, Yogi, maybe you can sort of address this uh, question. How do you sort of stay on top of continuous change, you know, and stay ahead and stay competitive while still being resilient? Because there's that trade-off to make as well. 
yeah as i already mentioned that um we have to be mindful that it's not just about technology so uh in these uh current uh times of changes uh first thing is to be aware of what are um like what are the changes that we can expect of course we cannot always predict what will change but you do get some idea say for example you know that gen ai is going to be big in next few years if you still continue um, to kind of ignore that uh, signal that you get from the industry and you think that no we are doing good we are having a good customer base no one can kind of uh, you know replace us that's that's a myth because uh, you really need to be uh, again it comes back to flexibility right and then understand and continuously reevaluate your business model because uh, technology will enable the digital transformations that you plan for your organization but in order to uh, identify what transformations you need to make within the organization to be in the business it's it's a complete view that you need to consider so you kind you continuously reevaluate your business model you evaluate your processes are you fast enough are you efficient enough to be in the industry because you may be efficient today but like luca mentioned you have to be forward looking right what is the target maybe today the things that you do may be efficient enough but tomorrow with ai and gen i availability there might be other players who are able to deliver faster than you right so you need to be ready for that change so continuously evaluating where do you need to change when do you need to be ready for change and then comes to the technology evaluating what technologies you can consider how you can deploy those while striking the balance right again it's yeah. all about cost you cannot always yeah. uh, i mean th there's also a, a, like a company that i am coming from it's huge and it's been there for more than 150 years now so there are a lo lot of legacy areas where uh, you have been having investments traditionally so you have to kind of have a, a a kind of point of realization when you eventually decide where you stop investing in those legacy systems and start investing towards new technologies and uh, towards uh, uh, the r&d side of things and um, ericsson is huge in r&d it's it's in our dna i mean we innovation is at the core of uh, how ericsson operates and that is what keeps us resilient in the business so i would say yes i mean uh, uh, look at all the aspects be flexible and make sure that you strike the right balance because you don't always need the most latest or shiny technology to deliver or, or do things that you can do in simple ways right you don't need gen ai for typing hello world <laughs> so yeah that is a, a few things that i would yogin if i can react quickly to what you just said um you, you mentioned the role of architects for the transforming the business model for innovation we, we talked a lot about how architects connect the dots so it's all about the operating model connecting processes it data architecture fully agree but now you're speaking about the business model so that, that's the product the services the customer journey what do you think is the role of architects to trigger that innovation because part of it will come from marketing from users from uh, innovation mm -hmm. teams as a enterprise architect what is your role for innovation i mean i get the agility the uh, the, the 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 resiliency the, the lean part but innovation itself that's a complex thing you know in your experience uh, how do you contribute to uh, innovation yeah um i would say that um uh, um as you know that i had a session on design thinking today right and it is very much something that is um, uh kind of an enabler towards innovation within an organization so innovation can ha happen at any level it's not just about technology it's not just about business or it's not just about process it could be 
in terms of finding innovative ways of doing things that you have been traditionally doing in a, an inefficient manner. So it could be in your ways of working. It could be innovation in uh, the kind of um, mindset that you have within the organization. And design thinking is very much a mindset. So as an enterprise architect, you need to connect closely with your business stakeholders to make sure that you are aligned with your um, enterprise roadmap, you see how your the architecture that you are designing uh, for uh, you know the to be architecture how is it aligned uh, with the level of maturity um, within uh, different areas within your organization is it aligned with your strategic roadmap is it um, kind of um, in line with your uh, budget allocations within the organization so uh, Luca, I would think that, you know, as enterprise architect, we have different areas that we can influence from the innovation point of view. Um, if you talk about technology, of course, that is very straightforward in terms of finding uh, new technologies that can enable and optimize the existing uh, ways of working. But from the process point of view, it could also be a mindset shift. It could be automating things. How do you um, kind of reduce redundancy? How do you simplify things that are complicated today? Innovation could also be around when you talk about um, uh, process side of things, having a common process for multiple units within the organization. That could be an innovation where they have been traditionally being operating in silos. So it can be at any level. And Enterprise architects uh, could be a business architect or a process architect or an information architect, data architect or technology architect. All of these people can contribute in their specific areas to make sure that uh, we are uh, innovative enough or we are ready enough for changes that we can foresee within the industry. I'm probably going to just jump in and say something, which is like, I completely agree with Yogini here, which is, any architect, right? It's it's about the mindset. An architecture, an um, architecture as a practice, or architect is is the mindset, right? Anybody can draw pretty boxes, um, uh, and it's it's about connecting dots, as you said. But the way that you're structuring your architecture, it has to be designed with change in mind, right? Um, if you don't do that, the risk is that you're always set in the business kind of like the you know a legacy domain kind of system i see i see a, a very interesting comment in, in in the section which is talking about hey an enterprise architect is is actually the ceo and his management the risk and the factor um why you actually separate the ceo and management and the architecture side away from each other is because of scenarios like what kodak has had right and and what uh, you know what steve jobs did to Nokia, for example. So you, you take these things. If you're set in your mind, BlackBerry, not Nokia, right? Uh, if you set in your mind that this is always the case, and if you're thinking that a, an, an architect or CEO, whatever it is, I am un, I am unadaptable. I won't look at change. I won't look at the new technologies. You're setting yourself up for failure. When you think of you know fast changing environments like the like the AI ML space, the Gen AI space, AI has existed for decades. It's not a new thing. Whereas in the last 10 years, because of certain advancements in the underlying infrastructure pieces with GPUs, the, you know, the way that the models are being created has enabled people to think in a different way. I always think of innovation as optimization of existing technologies in a way, right? Like, hey, you know, this this exists like this, but it takes me so long to do this. But I'm gonna start changing it. I'm gonna see if I can do it faster, better, simpler, right? That's where innovation starts. And as architects, it's always we are, you know, based on the mindset, as I mentioned, mindset, right? We always have to think about optimizing the architecture. Like, can I make this better? Can I make this simpler? Can I make this easier? That's how you drive innovation and drive change. <laughs> so um hope that kind of like uh, resonates with you guys, but that's that's what I'm, I'm thinking. So, so just going back to the question about you know separating enterprise architect and uh, CEO and management, what what's your uh, thought around like wh why is that happening exactly in sort of one one 
why should you mentioning the the question in the chat right yeah that too and uh, because I, was, I was reading that too and i i kind of agree with both uh, the question and the comment this is a and you guys were saying the same thing before there's not a single architect or architect profile in the company there's so many and some are it some are more business architects so the process architect the business architect that's more with the strategy. And definitely the CEO is the chief business architect. I fully agree with that answer. But then there's the enterprise architect. And I see the enterprise architect as being, in most cases, yes, reporting to the CIO, but that's changing. Could be in the strategy department, could be in the innovation department very well. Because I see the topic of enterprise architecture a bit of, as overarching the different types of architects. It's, it's more like it's a smaller group. I mean, you may have 200 solution architects and 10 enterprise architects because they kind of put things together connecting the dots to me is more enterprise architecture it's more about like uh, paul from yasa would say it's more about it business architecture enterprise architecture means the connection i mean in the end if you're just talking about your technologies that's your cmdb if you're just talking about your processes that's your process design tool but enterprise architecture owns the connections right so enterprise architecture to me is a bit overarching, but now the the challenge I see when I hear uh, Yogini speak about uh, design, I love it, design thinking, design for change. So there's a part which is what you have today, but then if you want to design for change and innovate, where do you start? You know, the, one of the challenges I, I face regularly is, okay, you, you're not gonna map the transformation for everything with 10 architects, right? So then where do you focus first and where do you plan change first, right? And this was a question that I received in my session also, like, where do you start uh, with design thinking? Because um, uh, design thinking is uh, kind of perceived today um, as something that will, you know, um, I had even mentioned this in one of the key takeaways that it's not a magic wand that will fix all your problems, right? It is a tool for you to connect with your business stakeholders, with your customers, to understand what are their top pain points, where do you want to focus your transformation towards, and to refine your business problem statement to make sure that you are directing your resources and energy in the right direction. So that is where you start. You start um, interacting with uh, you, uh, identify a set of users that you want to have detailed interviews with, it could be either your uh, customers or uh, it could be your business stakeholders in an enterprise context. And then you have these um, uh, human interactions with them. I I'm uh, um, kind of stressing here on human interactions because that is where you can actually catch the empathy part because not everything is on the surface. We as humans can read or learn more through interactions than machines can, right? So then we understand what is the kind of emotional aspect in terms of what is their level of frustration, what are the top pain points, uh, what um, are the areas that we should be focusing on, what are their expectations, and then we draw an empathy map uh, out of it um, under multiple categories and we see which are the highest areas where we have maximum frustration how important is it in your user journey how important is it for your revenue model and then you kind of you know accordingly prioritize what you want to work on so it helps you in identifying what you should start working on and then it's uh, the transformation that actually helps you kind of be ready for it right but in order to identify where you start you can use design thinking and that is how it contributes and i'm following at the same time the discussion in the chat and and i do agree it's always the it's always this uh, multiple roles of the it architects or where often enterprise architects are indeed and the business architects but to me the um, the evolution that I see today, it's that, is that back a few years back, enterprise architecture was technological, it was IT. It was the, the portfolio of, uh, of applications, right? 
And like you guys are saying, it's evolving towards the business, not just the business architects, but enterprise architects connecting what was the just the IT portfolio with business architecture. And now you're shifting from managing uh, your as is portfolio, cost saving and all that good stuff into transforming, transforming the business model, transforming by design thinking. So yes, you're going to focus. You're going to focus on a specific domain, I believe, if you want to transform your HR, your sales, uh, et cetera, but, uh, or your products themselves. But yeah, shifting from managing that as is set of applications into transforming the business, that is the evolution of architecture. And maybe it is also a question of maturity. You know, If I had to say to someone, oh, I just started EA, where should I start? I would say, yeah, start with the, with the with the IT part because I think it's more accessible. It's a good place to demonstrate quick value and everyone knows how key it is to show value as an architect. But then how do you get to the, the design thinking, the designing change? I think that's the exciting part of it. So, so if you look at where enterprise architecture is going to, uh, look, I'm just using your sort of vision of where it's going heading. Uh, to me, it sounds like uh, an enterprise architect would have to influence, but not have necessarily the control or the power over different parts of an organization, but maybe they would need to be able to influence them. Uh, and that requires a pretty different sort of skill set as well. I, I love it. And yes, it's also what Muhil and Yogini said. In fact, when I speak about maturity for EA, I use four maturity uh, levels from noisy to useful to trusted to influential. Mm -hmm. the, the utmost state of the enterprise architect is influential. You're not, you're not the CIO, you're not the COO, so you're not in charge of, of implementing and making those decisions, but you're the number one influencer. And, uh, and very often, if you're in IT, you are the, the, the influencer to the CIO to make strategic decisions on uh, uh, rationalizations, uh, new technologies, uh, which ones should be allowed, prohibited. Yeah, I couldn't say better. It's the, influ the, the top influencer, in my opinion. I, I actually, I very much agree with it. Influencing is a key skill for any architect, right? Like it, yeah, and, and you are always seen as a supporting function for any of the domains that the business has, the enterprise has. Um, so, like we talked about the IT side of things, the technology side of things, there is a, an, a, a use case here. Think of like a new technology is coming into play. How can the business apply this new technology? Like we were talking about Gen AI, like how, how and where does this apply? It might not apply anywhere, but is there, can there be innovations that can be done to apply these new things? It supports the business, but these are like more conversations and influencing conversations and, you know, brainstorming, whiteboard. Those are the things that that supports uh, the business decisions. Like, so influencing is key. Thought leadership is also key because um, an architect needs to be kind of um, always on the lookout, always learning, right? Tying back to the original kind of topic about resiliency, the resiliency for, uh, you know, uh, from external fact, like to, to, to be able to resist external um, threats and more threats and you know threats in, in various different domains, you always have to be agile. You always have to be nimble. And being this influence, influencing influencer inside inside the organization, and then and at various levels, uh, an architect has to speak various languages. You have to speak the CIO language as much as you have to speak the engineering language as well, right? Because how does that business vision translate to the actual output? that either mm -hmm. the engineers are developing, the engineering can be an IT engineer, it can be a process engineer, it can be an, you know, a manufacturing person on the floor of, of a manufacturing unit as well. Because it, it applies to everything. So, and you know, an architect has to speak all these different languages, keeping resiliency in mind, resilience at all the different levels as well. Nice. I love that. Um, I see we're also at time. Uh, Although we don't have seem to have a sort of a timer or a reminder, but uh, I guess this is a sort of good place to uh, bring this to a close. So uh, thank you, Mohan. Thank you, Luca. Uh, thank you, Yogini. Um, this has been a very interesting uh, chat. Uh, I know I've learned quite a bit about enterprise architecture in the process. 
So um, yeah, thank you guys. Thanks. Thank, thank you, all. you all. Thanks for the questions. That was fun. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you.